guys, welcome llamas. We're gonna be talking about the Renaissance in Italy for theater history. Let's get started, shall we? Well, first we're gonna talk about what is the Renaissance. Well, Renaissance comes from the, an Italian word meaning rebirth. So this just really describes the transition from medieval to more of a modern world in Western Europe. It started in Italy because this was where the ancient ruins of Greek and Roman, and it really inspired a rebirth of old art in this time period. Also, because the trade with Asia, Africa, and the Mediterranean produced enough wealth for people to really actually invest in arts. And that's one thing, like, when you notice from the ancient Greeks to the Italians, you know, the reason why art is produced is because now that you have an abundance of wealth or even just the abundance of, you know, having security and food and shelter, you can then invest it into other things like music, theater, dance, etc. So the Renaissance in Italy. Now, the Roman Catholic Church, was based within Italy and started to support artists, writers, and scholars in the Renaissance. So uh, before this, they weren't really supporting them, but now they're like giving them their blessings and sometimes even financial uh, backing to writers and artists. The first sign of change was a new awareness of dramatic form that came from the study of Roman plays. So they really studied the dramatic, like, this is how plays are written, this is what is a good play, this is what is a bad play, etc. They learned also to build the physical architecture of theaters from the example of Roman buildings. And in a second, I'm going to show you a side-by-side -side of ruins of an ancient Roman theater and a Renaissance theater, so you can see how close they are. The Italian theater developed quite differently and a lot sooner than the English Renaissance and the Spanish Renaissance. So we're talking about the Italians first, and in my next video, I'll be talking about the English Renaissance, which we know as like Elizabethan. So here again, I wanted to show you that Roman versus Italian Renaissance theaters. So obviously one of the biggest difference is that the Italian Renaissance are now indoor. It's covered up. We also, you're gonna notice that the audience is a lot smaller size than the Romans. Um, so let me bring my mouse in. This that I'm circling, that's the Romans and that's the Italian Renaissance. This wall of like columns and things, you kind of see this here with like, you know, arches and like these would have like busts of like gods and goddesses from the Roman time period and that's what they kind of had. You're also going to notice that there's some op certain openings as there is here in the Roman. All right, so you again, you see that semicircle of the audience sitting, and then you have little playing areas. They're very similar. Obviously, the Italian Renaissance are indoors, so we're not using natural light. They started doing theater at night and during the day. They would use candles and lighting, etc. All right, another important uh, introduction of something in the Italian Renaissance was the invention of opera. Opera was introduced in Italy and first record a first recorded a uh, performance, not like recorded like music we could hear it because recordings didn't happen at this time period. Was in 1594. Before 1594, between the acts of plays, we would get these things called intermezzi. Intermezzi's were little song and dance and a little bit of dialogue, almost kind of like little musical numbers like we would think today. In total, audiences saw six of these intermezzi's in a, sh in a play. The intermezzi's was connected with a beginning, middle, and end. So you would have like your play, your like normal play where they're acting, they're talking to each other back and forth, and then you would have intermezzi, and then you have some more play, and then your intermezzi, and so forth. And the intermezzi's told a different story than the play. People started to really like to watch these much more than some of the plays. So they decided they would string them all together and that would be making our first opera. Now, one of the big things in Italian Renaissance was the invention of new technologies. So some of this is like the vanishing perspective. 
the vanishing perspective is the idea that the farther the way something gets, the smaller it gets, like tunnel vision. You can see in this painting here in the sketch, you can see how it looks like it's way deeper than it actually is. And they did this through painting. Paintings. They would use paintings to show vanishing perspective to make it look like the stage was really deep when it wasn't. The next thing is a counterweight system. We still use counterweight systems today. This is where you have weights off stage that counterweight something on stage that you could pull and it would bring something up out of the way. So like curtains, we usually use counterweight systems for curtains. Then we have the thing, oh, here is a um, modern counterweight system. If you just wanna watch, you can see that there's pulleys and levers and you have to use the counterweight to bring help you bring things up easily. You can use counterweight systems to help fly actors today. They didn't do this back in the Italian Renaissance, but I just wanted to show you a counterweight system and this isn't a great example. They're just using it to take a human in and out. All right, the next one was the chariot and pool. So where a um, counterweight system brings things up and down, a chariot and pole system brings things side to side. Let me see if I can get this to play for y'all. This is a professor kind of trying to explain it, but we're not gonna listen to him. Um, but he's explaining that like this counterweight system would have like different levels of scenery and one would move in front of the other. He's using a shaft poster. Ah, let me see if I can get him to play a little bit lot quicker. I think he's just explaining it. So anyways, that's chariot and pool. So we had these technological advances. There was also the invention of different candles and mechanisms to use light, but they're kind of very rudimentary at the beginning of the Italian Renaissance. So let's get mo moving on to a very important part of the Italian Renaissance, and that is the Commedia dell'arte. The Commedia dell'arte means the comedy of professional players. This was high, it was comedy, and it was something that everyone loved. This was performed by professional troops that specialize in comedic improvisation. This happened. This helped the spread and the resurgence in theater. So the people that would be in this theater are people that are gonna have a lot more money and more wealth. And yes, that helps, but the everyday person couldn't afford that. So they would watch the Commedia dell'arte. The Commedia dell'arte would travel through all through the land and there'd be stories and they would set up like a, with a wagon, kind of like the medieval pageant wagon and they would perform for wherever they could. And they would perform in bars, and they would perform outside, and they perform wherever. And that's why um, we ha helped spread theater a lot more. The origins are relatively unknown, but it's said to have started circa 1520. Parts of the Commedia. They have specific plots, like they had, they would be called scenarios. These scenarios would be like, everyone, like, everyone in the troop would know the different scenarios, and they'd be like, oh, there are lots and lots of scenarios, where they knew, the, like, that basic plot outline. So they knew the beginning, middle, and end, they knew the basic events, but the dialogue was improvised. Now, they would do it over and over and over, so they kind of had some certain dialogue and speeches that they would memorize, but it was not like written down and memorized as we would memorize a script today for a play. The set itself was really minimal. Like I said, they would perform wherever they could, so they could set up on top of a table in a bar and perform, and that'd be fine. But they did have a lot of props, a lot of things that they would carry on and like use to help with the comedy. They also have these things called stock characters. These are characters that are specifically seen in all the plays. It is also characters that um, the audience would get to know really well. And people who would watch each comedy troupe, there's multiple comedia troops, they would recognize these characters from troupe to troupe. And then lastly, another main part of the commedia was the Lazzi. These are the comedic bits. This would be that slapstick comedy that you might get used to seeing in cartoons or like the um, silent movie kind of things, etc. that were really funny and silly, slapstick. 
Commedia was so important that it influenced so many more people after its main, its like popularity, its main majority popularity. And that includes the likes of Shakespeare, Moliere, cartoons, comedians, and even early film stars. Slapstick comedy has its origin in Commedia. So people like Charlie Chaplin, uh, the Three Stooges, Lucille Ball had a lot of got a lot of their slapstick comedy routines based off these Lazzi from Commedia dell'arte. Now, the big thing we're going to cover about them is these stock characters. These characters you're going to recognize in modern comedies and comedies throughout history after this. And you can even think about these characters possibly evolving from the ancient Romans. So let's talk about them. Again, specific groups of characters used to in every show were stock characters. The first um, stock character is Pantalone. This is the miserly money grabber, if you think about it. His status is that he's a master, so they're either a master or a servant in the Commedia dell'arte. Um, so the masters are usually rich or wealthy, and that's why they have servants. So, But he is the master. He is a rich master. He usually has a... They all wear masks, except for certain characters, because, and we'll explain that in a second. And his mast had like a hooked nose, bushy eyebrows, and a pointy beard. And then he also had a prop of either and or, he could have both, a money pouch and a cane. He kind of walked, like, crouched over. Um, think of like Scrooge as kind of an example of Pantalone. Pantalone's costume really was like a red vest, or pants, black cloak, and yellow shoes. Here are some more pictures of a drawings of Pantalone. You can see with his red pants, his yellow shoes, you can see that mask, you can see those bushy eyebrows, the pointy beard, kind of the like hooky nose. The next master we have is El Dottore, or the doctor. The Dottore doesn't necessarily have to be a doctor, they just supposed to be supposedly a learned person, even though they probably weren't. They usually pretend they knew a lot, but they really didn't know what they were talking about. Their mask was a nose and forehead only, so that the actor's cheeks could be really red. Um, the prop was either a book or a handkerchief. The costume of the Torre was academic robes, like we would see in graduation. But this is if you were a doctor, or if you were a professor, or if you were a lawyer, you would wear these kind of things. And he's always pushing that he's really smart. You see the black robe, kind of like a hanky or a book or a briefcase. Um, you see in his mask that it's just forehead and the eyes and the nose, but the cheeks would be really red. The next master we have is Capitano, also known as the Cowardly Captain. He was a master and usually he's dressed as a soldier or he was a soldier, supposedly. Um, his mask has a long nose, and his prop, his main prop was a sword. And his costume was either military or military-inspired. Now, even though he, you, you're like, okay, well, cowardly, though, he's a soldier. Well, he would be all bravado, meaning, like, he'd all be like, yeah, I'll fight you, I'm so tough and so strong, I, I killed all these people, but when he was con be confronted with a fight, he would like scream like a little girl and run away. Here are some drawings of El Capitano. You can see the sort of brightly inspired military with his sword, um, his mask, look at the big long nose and a big mustache that he would kind of twirl as well. These next two, they're a pair, they're the Imatori, or Emirato or Emirata are the lovers. They are masters. Um, they were usually the son and or daughters of the Pantalone and uh, El Dottore. Their mask would be none. They were supposed to look nice and beautiful. They may have like beauty mark or or makeup on, but no mask. Their props would be like handkerchiefs, posies, fans. So like. Um, like, back in the day, if a man gave you his handkerchief, he was, you know, he could be, you could give your handkerchief to a man to show favor. Um, there was the art of the fan. The fan could mean things, etc. 
And their costume would be the latest fashion, usually with some sort of heart motif, and they would kind of match each other. Um, our lovers were kind of the the force of the story. So the, the idea of most scenarios is that the lovers want to be together, which makes sense. So you can see here, um, like especially this red, white, and blue couple up here, they kind of have a matchy motif. They're kind of like opposites of each other, lots of makeup, etc. The next couple, uh, the next two that we're going to cover, there are more stock characters that I'm talking about, but these are the main ones that you're going to see. The next two are part of our servant status. Now, Colombina is also a Zani. Zani are our servants that kind of get up to mischief. So she is the maid to the girl. So she would wear no mask, but she would be heavily made up. Sometimes she would have a mask with eyelashes or something like that to note that she is very pretty, um, etc. Her main props were either a basket to like be holding things for for the for the emirata, or like a tambourine, because she was very over the top. She's a very sassy character, has a lot of attitude. Her costume is usually a dress with an apron, bright colors, and a diamond pattern. The idea behind the diamond pattern for her and the next character is that they are poor and they take the scraps from their master's clothing that they didn't use for whatever reason and they turn that patchwork kind of diamonds into their clothes. Here are some examples of Colombina. All right, our last guy we're going to cover is Arlequino. He's again a Zani servant. He is known for being the trickster. He's mask is always big eyes and big brows because he's supposed to be over top reactions and his prop of choice is a slapstick a slapstick is this really cool device that you can like look like you're hitting someone and it's a mechanism that makes a <laughs> slap noise hence it looks like they're beating someone up when they're not actually the costumes are again that diamond patchwork that we talked about with um colombina and bright colors and he is always like the trickster servant trying to get more than he probably has and he's all he's smarter than what people think he is here is some arlequino drawings and paintings and pictures you can see that big eyebrows for the expression well guys this has been the italian renaissance in theater i hope you've learned a lot Go to my playlist and check out some of the other videos that may be helpful for you learning more about the Italian Renaissance and Camille dell'arte. I'll see you next time. Later, llamas!